where you live would probably be considered maybe like the gateway to the West. And so you'd expect, I know, I know you handle some draughts and you do some, some typically kind of Western pointing, big ranging dogs, but are, are you still handling a fair amount of retrievers? Do you see a lot of them still? I, so in the last six months, I'll bet take 50% of the dogs and they're something, right? Great Danes, poodles, draught hard. And then the other 50% are labs, like just solid labs. Is that it, it, that probably just comes from their the amount of duck hunting that's <laughs> yeah, and they're the most popular dog in yeah, America. Yeah, by a far shot. So you do you have uh, you know you mentioned Great Danes and in, in some dogs that are definitely not considered hunting dogs. Is this are those coming to you just for obedience? Yeah, for the most part. Um, like I had a I had a French bulldog a little while ago and. I mean, the, the owners were just kind of at their wits end. They're like, we don't know what to do with it. Like it, we cannot take it on a walk without it just choking itself to death on the end of the line. And if any type of distraction is on the road, whether it's a car, whether it's a human clear down at the other end, the dog just barks constantly, at, you know? And so that one, I mean, I think it was partly the owners just didn't, have a like a firm enough handle on the dog like they were they walked the dog on a harness because they're like oh it's choking itself to death i'm like it's not gonna choke itself to death put it on a regular just regular lead like the dog's gonna learn and so you know i mean there's a lot of that stuff i mean yeah it's a basic obedience but it's still just kind of general manners like hey walk next to me buddy not out here yeah yeah how how valuable is that to you you know you kind of dip your toe in the waters of being a breeder limited you know limited litters and then as a trainer you get to see some of those come back like how valuable is it to see you know that dog go to somebody else for a while i'm assuming then come back to you for whatever level of bird introduction or whatever level of training you're doing you can go all right. Does it inform your future decisions? Do you go, okay, this dog's turning out this way. I want to lean into that or lean away from it. Oh, absolutely. So like with Drothar, I mean, we touched on it a little bit last time we talked, but I mean, they have a, a incredibly strict breeding program. Um, and so with the combination of that male and female, there was 10 puppies and half of them have, I mean, just the baby soft, coat like it and and a lot of people if like if you don't know what you're looking and feeling you know because i call everybody i'm like hey how's the dog doing what's going on how's it feel what's it doing and this one guy the dog that i have in now i'm like hey how's it doing what's going on he's like oh you know i mean it's it's a good dog it's you know happy it's got a pretty good coat coat on a dog is freaking amazing like not uh, pretty good like so they rate it on a scale of um, one to twelve. And I, when I was getting my female bred, the the dog I was breeding to, the owner's a breed show judge. I was like, hey, you know, I'm pretty excited about this dog's coat. What do you think of it? And he's like, like he just barely touched. It. He's like, that's an eleven, easy, maybe a twelve, which is like the most perfect coat you can get. Whereas when you're just getting that little bit of feedback from the owner, they're like, oh, yeah, it's nice. I'm like, no, dude, that's not nice. That's amazing. Well, my question there, what what does that matter? Like what, the the amazing coat, what, what are the implications of that? Okay, you hunt a lot with your dog, right? At the end of a season, what does its face look like? <laughs> it looks like it's been putting out fires with its nose. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So if you get – so. A draught heart is a really fancy wire hair, right? So if you look at, I've got three of them. I've got one with a pretty soft coat, one with a fairly hard coat, and one with a really good hard coat. If I run all three of those dogs pretty much the same amount at the end of hunting season, the one with a soft coat, especially on the front of its paws right here, or just along its face, I mean, it's going to look pretty rough that one with a fairly hard coat 
you're not going to see hardly any wear and tear. This dog that I have now, I'll bet you I could pound cattails with it for two months straight. And just, it's going to, it's going to look like it's got a nice big thick beard and that's going to thin out a little bit. But for the most part, you're not going to see that much damage on the dog just because it's, it's a protective layer. So interesting. Is that tied? I mean, can you, can you follow that, the coat quality back to like higher drive dogs or dogs that have been work that are just, it, it, it sounds like there, those different coats have developed from dogs that were asked different things. And, you know, like a hardcore hunter, the way you're describing that more wiry coat that can handle a whole lot of abuse, can that be traced back to dogs that are just like in your mind, are they just better dogs, like better hunting dogs? I have a, I don't know if you could get a direct correlation with that because the dog that I have that's got a soft coat, I mean, she'll throw down, period. You know, she has, she goes, it's funny because she'll, she's the happiest dog I've ever seen. Like, it's a pain to take her to a hotel because her tail's just always wagging. So, like, you lay down in a hotel room and you just hear the whole time. Um, but then as soon as like you see a coon or like she'll run down coyotes and kill them. I mean, she's just a high drive evil dog as soon as it's time to get after it. So the goal is to breed for that coat. Well, not one of the goals is to breed for that coat just out of protection and to help the dog, you know, throughout its life. But mm-hmm. that the, the dogs that are, the tail waggers like that, that are just ready to work and go. We just did, uh, we spent some time out at Dawkins place out in, in South Dakota. And he had a dog there. Uh, I think it was like a three-year-old yellow lab named Earl. And that dog, you'd look at that dog and the tail would start going. He's like, Oh, what, what are we going to do, bud? <laughs> and it was so interesting. Cause you're watching, you know, you're watching a super high level trainer, interact with multiple dogs, goldens and labs of different ages and varieties. But that dog, I think anybody, even if you didn't know anything about dogs, you look at that one and go, I, I kind of want that one. That one seems like it's just a gamer and ready to please and sits there and smiles with the tail all the time. And it's just, it's, it's so fun to see a dog that wants to work. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, uh, and I think you can get more out of a dog that does that. I mean, I always joke with people. I'm like, you know, I'd rather tame a tiger than push a turtle. So... <laughs> You know, I, like that, that happy go get dog, like plain and simple, you're going to get more out of that dog than, you know, one that you have to encourage to get off its bed. Yeah, for sure. The, it's, it's better to have to rein them in than <laughs> try to develop something <laughs> yeah. that isn't there. Uh, yeah. A lot of the, a lot of the questions we're getting lately involve preseason tune-ups and preseason training and you know they they vary so wildly and i'm sure you've heard every one of them but the the one thing that i really wanted to ask you is like what do you see amateur handlers what are the mistakes they're making from now you know aside from the hot weather issue from now until you know dove opener or maybe sharpie opener prairie chickens open or whatever and then into pheasants and grouse and the whole thing like what are the preseason mistakes people are making I think the biggest problem is like basic obedience, just simple foundational stuff. Like if you can't tell the dog to sit and go open a door without it running through it, how are you going to expect it to sit and wait in a duck blind when you got 20 mallards working over top or a bird flushing up in front of it, you know? So between just basic obedience and conditioning, I think, conditioning you know i mean that's huge for sure so this kind of and maybe i'm wrong here so correct me if i'm wrong but it feels like you know people kind of this there's there's a parallel here to being a bow hunter and i know you understand this where the a a small percentage of hunters shoot all year round and Mm -hmm. a small percentage start shooting you know maybe in the spring all through the summer and maybe ramp up as August hits and you get closer to season, but then <laughs> you're pointing at yourself and then you've got a, a fair amount of bow hunters. Go, they sit around, they fish all summer, they golf, they do whatever. And then, you know, mid August hits and they go, I gotta, I gotta get to the range. I gotta see if I can still oh, shoot. Yeah. 
and you see them go and they'll fire a few shots and then they're backing up to 40, 50, 60 yards and they want to have some fun with it. And it feels like the same kind of parallel with dogs where you go, man, dove season's only, you know, a couple weeks away or we're going to be grouse hunting mid-September. We better get the dog out. And instead of paying attention to those fundamentals you're talking about, they go, well, we probably should work on some triple blind retrieves because that's more fun yeah. and just really skip a lot of the necessary buildup. Yeah, I you know, I, everything comes to that foundational stuff. Like you, you cannot expect a dog to do a triple blind if it's not just going to wait for the bird to get shot. Like if it's already out running around going crazy, trying to find that first one, you know, you've already lost. Luck. So what else, what, what other mistakes do people make? Anything you can think of? Oh, uh, I think that a lot of people now that it's hot, they, especially retriever guys, they're like, I'm just going to go out and throw some retrieves and call it good. You know, whereas setting the dog up in an actual scenario to like a hunting typical scenario, like, hey, we need to have this blind here versus like, hey, we're at the lake this weekend. Let's, you know, chuck it in. Yeah. I think that that's maybe one of the most common mistakes people make, right? Is just not setting up the training to, you know, it, you're not going to maybe get it perfect, but you can get close to mirroring hunting environments and hunting situations. And it's, it's more work, but it's so worth it. 